done. Sorry. Got it. Um, so with our sibling organization, which is the Alliance for Quality Education, we work really, really closely. The executive director, Jasmine Gripper, is here today. I think she'll weigh in as well. We've had some big wins. The biggest one that I can, I, I am so incredibly pleased, and we will see this in school districts all across New York State, is the foundation aid, the campaign for, vis, for fiscal equity. This took decades to achieve. And in Governor Hochul's budget, um, I believe it's $2.7 billion going towards schools foundation aid. And the idea here being, we know that the way our public schools are funded, it comes from our tax base, which means that wealthier communities may have better resources simply because of the tax base. So there's education is supposed to level the playing field. If you don't have an equal tax base, the playing field is already rigged. And this campaign for fiscal equity is geared towards leveling that playing field so that communities that may not have a robust tax base are getting the aid that they need and that their kids deserve to level that playing field. So if you look at what this means, the city of Alb Albany City School District is over 17 billion. Buffalo is 72 million billion. I, that, sorry, I just I, I talk in billions these days. But if you look at these numbers, these are enormous amounts of resources for schools. And that's a huge win. And then part of what we do in the aftermath is once the, as we it, we talk to our school districts, we lobby at the local level as well as the state as well as the state level to say, how are you spending that money? Are you spending it on things like more social workers, new textbooks, after school programs, all of these things that really, really need to happen so our kids have the experience they deserve? And as Jasmine said in the chat, the increases in funding are what these school districts will receive. And then our job as citizens living within these communities is to make sure that it's being spent in a way that serves our children. And um, it was epic funding, as it says, that brought major changes to New York that really does allow kids to have a quality education, a quality public education, no matter their zip code. And that's what every kid deserves. Um, so that is a huge win for us. Another big win that we had was last year, we got record funding for childcare. We got about 1.8 billion from the governor. It's the largest investment that has ever happened. It's not enough, not nearly enough. And I, just to, just so you know, we are asking for five billion dollars this year in childcare funding, and it has three planks. The first plank is investing in the workforce because childcare workers who are predominantly women and predominantly women of color are in the lowest three percent of earners, and many of them are on public assistance because they're not being paid a living wage. So what we're asking for is a $1 billion investment in the workforce that will raise their salaries. Um, and it's modeled after Washington, D.C.'s program, which they have been implementing, raises their salaries by over $10,000, which can really lift somebody out of poverty. And then we also put um, a health care like access fund as well, because for some of these folks, if they get that raise, they're bumped out of Medicaid. This is the type of situation that the people caring for our youngest citizens and youngest people are, are in. So we're trying to invest in them because part of the part of the problem is in New York State, more than half of us can't access high quality child care. It, it's what's called a child care desert. So for every three kids who need child care, there's one spot. So we can't have a child, like a better child care landscape if we don't have the workers. So the big ask is the workforce investment. And that is $1.2 billion, a billion dollars in wage increase and $2 million going towards healthcare funding. And um, the other issue, other planks of this is making it more accessible for parents, making it easier, removing some of those barriers, increasing eligibility. Because for so many parents, if you're trying to navigate this system, it, it's complicated, it's messy, it's not easy to figure out. So it's about reducing those barriers to entry so that more parents can access this child care. So paying the workforce more, paying them a living wage, making it easier for parents. And then the third piece um, is investing in children no matter their, and the fam their families no matter their immigration status. Because right now, a, ki a child whose family, um, if, if they are undocumented or if they're an asylum seeker, they are not eligible 
And that means that we are, again, starting this inequity so very young because we know that those first three years of a child's life, that zero to three, so much brain development happens there. Every moment is a teachable moment in those early years, whether it's like eating a meal or reading a book or playing with toys, all of those things matter, the socialization. So we want to make sure that these things are happening for every child and every family, regardless of immigration status. Those are the three main planks of... um our child care work, as well as celebrating our foundation aid win and making sure that our local school districts are spending it in the interest of children. Before I get into our last piece, which is not a monetary ask, these are both, the, the foundation aid is in the budget. The governor has promised that. She has also talked about child care. We are looking to go past that. Um, the next two things are not monetary. So I just want to stop and just see if you have any money questions. You can drop them in the chat or, nope, we're okay. Um, um, actually, oh. I do. Okay. So is going to base salary or agency cost of living, living agencies. Um, Jasmine, I think it's base salaries. Can you correct me if I'm wrong? For the 10,000 for child care workers? Yes. It is a direct, almost like a bonus for them. It's a short-term fix. Uh, it's modeled after what they did in Washington, D.C. It's a it's almost like a bonus to child care workers as we fix the long term problem, which is raising the rates uh, and the reimbursement rate that the state pays providers. So it's right now it would be essentially like a bonus. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the other two planks. So Governor Hochul gave us um, in the budget that we were thrilled with was the two point seven billion dollars of foundation aid. There's also an expansion for charter schools in New York City, raising the cap. We don't want that because we want that money going to public education. Charter schools can cherry pick who are coming in. They don't have the same metrics of accountability that our public schools do. So taking money that should be going to our public schools, it should be going to our neighborhood schools, and putting them in charters is a non-starter for our organization. So we will be pushing to reject the charter school expansion that is part of Governor Hochul's um, budget. And that is going to be going on over the next few weeks. While it is concentrated in New York City, we will be mobilizing a statewide effort to push back against that charter expansion because we don't want it in New York City and we don't want it anywhere else either. So There'll be more about that. We actually have an event coming in New York City this week on the 21st. I can drop that in the chat as well. We just put up, got our, our poster together, our flyer together for that. But um, it is really important that we do not expand our charter schools and that we really allow our public schools the funding they deserve to flourish. Um, and... Oh, Sam has a whole slide on charters, so we can totally slip to that. But let me just do one more quick thing and just talk about our one other um, non-budgetary task. We're not asking for money here. We're, do we have a slide for solutions, not suspensions, Sam? No? Okay, so let me talk solutions, not suspensions. Then we can always go to the charter and expand on that a bit. Um, so solutions, not sus suspensions is a school climate bill. And this is another, to, I see it as like a civil rights bill, honestly, because School suspensions just this year, um, the 21-22 school year, kids lost over 900,000 days of learning to suspensions. And those kids are disproportionately Black, Brown, students with disabilities, and LG LGBTQ plus students. And they are getting suspended as young as pre-K. So we are looking to correct that because we know there's a couple of things going on here. There is a youth mental health crisis. And when you take kids out of their school community, when you remove them from community and resources, one of two things happen. If they're a little, if they're a young child, most likely their parent is staying home with them. So now you're forcing that parent, usually the woman, to lose income, right? You're now putting their livelihood at risk for your, the child's suspension. And the kid's not getting the learning and the resources and all the things they need. And when they're an older child, their secondary student, the likelihood is they're home alone. And with everything going on, with the lear learning loss, with the trauma of COVID, with um, the mental health crisis, that is a tragedy waiting to happen. And we are trying to prevent that as often as possible. So the planks of this bill, of the Solutions Not Suspensions Act, is eliminating suspensions for children grades pre-K 
through three, our youngest like in school system learners, unless it's federally mandated. The second part of it is reducing the length, the maximum length of suspensions. Right now, a child can be suspended for up to 180 days. That is an entire school year that they could be removed from their community. And we're trying to reduce that. We're trying to say, hey, if you have to suspend somebody and let's make that a last resort, it shouldn't be longer than 20 days. That's already a month. And when you think about that removal from a community and the learning loss and all of those things, it's hard to be out of anything for a month, let alone a year. And some other um, things that we're looking to do is put in within school codes of conduct, restorative practices, preventative measures, things that will de-escalate before it gets to that level. First of all, saying if you show up late to school, if it's a dress code violation, if it's a minor behavior thing, kids shouldn't be getting suspended for that. There are alternatives. And really just thinking about like, if there are issues, can we address it with counseling? Can we address it with like behavior plans? Can we put specific things in place so that we can reduce the amount of time kids are being removed from school? So that's that's the basic premise of the Solutions Not Suspensions Act. It really is. And again, when we talk about resources in schools, I can speak from personal experience. Um, you know, I think that when you know, my, my my children's school um, has like a, you know, positive be behavioral intervention services, they have a school psychologist and a social worker in the school. If you have a, a district and a school that doesn't have those resources, Suspension is going to happen more often. It's going to happen more often with children of color. So we're trying to make sure that the money and the resources that are being poured into our schools right now, and additionally in the governor's proposal, she's putting $3 million in grants for alternative discipline to suspensions. She's also got $10 million in mental health counseling. We're asking the Solutions Not Suspensions Act is a perfect place to invest. And last thing I'll say about it is, we're not the only ones saying it. The New York State Education Department is, um, they just issued a report on school discipline and their recommendations match ours. And they say, you know what? Local control is no longer enough. We need legislative fixes. And they don't call for this bill specifically, but they, they call out and say, this is no longer okay. We cannot keep su disproportionately suspending Black, brown, LGBTQ students, um, disabled students. And I see one quick thing with the um, in the chat. So right now, the standard in schools, if a child is suspended, an elementary school student is getting about an hour of instruction a day, and a high school, secondary school can get about two hours. And we know that is not enough. That's it's just simply not enough. And we learned that in the in, you know in the first few months of COVID when remote learning was happening. So. This really seeks to right a lot of these systemic wrongs, this particular bill. It doesn't have a funding ask, but there is funding coming from the state that could be applied to change the school climate and can support this work. So that's my whole story. Scam, if you want to skip to the next slide, I'm sorry, I talked a whole lot and I'd be happy to grab any questions as we're changing slides. I see some stuff in the chat, but if you want to unmute yourself, let's let's talk. Okay. And um, you can see this is Jasmine right here. There's me behind her. Uh, she, she can certainly expand if there's any holes that I, I don't I don't fill here, but charter schools are publicly funded private schools. They only teach 14% of New York City students. There has been a cap on charter schools that has been filled for three years so that there are no new charters, right? And now she's, Governor Hochul is trying to allow charters to open up and um, count from the bucket of New York State's cap. And she's trying to reauthorize what are called zombie charters, which will add 100 new charter schools in New York City. And they weren't with us when it was time for the campaign for fiscal equity, That, which was like a 30-year battle on and off to get this funding for New York. This funding should go to our, our public schools because charter schools, do, like we said before, don't have the same metrics of accountability. They can cherry pick who's coming into their schools. And those resources belong in our publicly funded taxpayer dollar schools. So any questions thus far, far or Jasmine, do you want to jump in and fill in any holes I might have left? No, thanks, Shoshana. I'll just say, you know, we the advocacy is that we tell the assembly members and the senators are reject the governor's proposal on charters and maintain the cap and no new zombie charters either. 
Can you elaborate on what a zombie charter is? Because like, you know, these, these, okay, there it is. Yeah. So zombie charters is a term that is widely used in New York state. I don't know if it exists anywhere else, uh, but they, there are charter schools that opened up and they were accounted against the cap. And then that school may have closed down or lost its charter because it didn't meet its goals or had other problems. And so when the school closes down, it doesn't automatically go back under the cap. And so it's a school that's counted against the cap, but isn't actually operational at the time. And so we, they call them zombie charters. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't familiar with that term, but yeah. So I think, um, can we, can I take any questions at this point or any thoughts that anybody has? So that way this is like less me talking at you and more of a conversation. Cause I know I just threw a, a whole lot at all of you. I have one question. Yeah. Uh, so the solutions, not suspend, uh, the solution, not suspensions. Is that going to cover the special ed kids too, right? Because I know um, like they get their own category. So that's going to cover every kid. Yes. Yeah. And when we talk about students with disabilities, we are talking about what, it may be physical disabilities. It may be mental health issues. It may be learning disabilities. So yes, absolutely. And again, those are kids that are disproportionately suspended alongside Black, Brown, LGBTQ students. Any other questions or thoughts? Um, I'll just say real quick, I, I commented um, that uh, when, when administrators suspend kids, they don't care about their education, which is the whole point of fighting for solutions, not suspensions. Um, you know, somebody was commenting about how destructive it is that kids that are suspended get so little actual, you know, time help with their studying while they're suspended. And and that's what it comes down to is that being suspended has nothing to do with your education. It's just like, you know, it's it's prison for students, basically. We 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 aren't teaching you anything, we're just punishing you. And, you know, you make you make a great point, Amelia, because um, suspensions are directly tied to the school to prison pipeline. When a student is suspended, they are more likely to interact with law enforcement. They are more likely to drop out all of the things that education is supposed to level that playing field and a suspension puts you on that path that we do not want our kids to end up on. So that that is a really, really excellent point. I saw the question in the chat, are there different types of suspensions? Um, so yeah, there are short-term suspensions, there are long-term suspensions, but all of the data shows suspensions actually don't achieve a goal. And in the New York State Education Department report on this stuff, they basically, they said any suspension, even for any length of time, does not improve the outcome because you're not using, and I mean, I think, I, th I think about this a lot as both an educator, I come from K-12, and as a parent. Every moment with a child is a teachable moment, even the really bad ones, especially the bad ones sometimes. And if all you're doing is removing the child and not doing the work of the teachable moment, they're not going to learn from that mistake. They're not going to grow and improve from that mistake. It's just going to escalate. And I think that we are trying to use these moments because these are still young little people, even high school kids, they're still babies. Like these are teachable moments. Yeah, Ivan, I see your hand raised. Um, so I don't know how the other school districts oh, are, tomorrow, but yeah. here in Syracuse, um, so the reason why um, the governor came here is because a lot of our kids that was getting suspended, we we have mental health school based, right? So if the kid is out, uh, so if they are seeing mental health counselors in school, which is like a rise in Brownell, um, and they're getting suspended, they're not going to be able to see their mental health therapist because the mental health therapist is giving a therapy in school where he or she gives out to other, you know, to the other kids too. So um, that right there was like my biggest, when my kids was going through this and everything, that was my biggest, like I was outspoken about that and everything. And I still bring that up, like anytime that we're inside Albany and stuff. I have to sit there and let the assembly and senators know, like, at the end, if, if 
if you suspend my son or daughter, what do you want them to go get mental health? Because the waiting list for in clinical therapy is way too long. Yeah. And I think, oh, I want to make a couple of points because all of this between everything that's being said in the chat and here is, is, is so spot on. And these stories are so important when we lobby. Because, I mean, I know many of you on this call, and I know the experiences that you have lived through as students and as parents, and those stories matter. And I think that, you know, we're talking a lot of like policy and stuff here, but the truth is that the stories matter, you know, and I think that we, we can leave a one pager behind with all of the data, but your story is what I think really illuminates these truths, you know, more than any, any piece of paper with data ever will. And I think, you know, Amelia's point about the 12 counselors for 30 plus schools, that again is why that campaign for fiscal equity was so important. Because if you're, if you don't have the resources that your school deserves, you know, again, my, my son's school has multiple social workers and a school psychologist on the premises. And every school, every child deserves that. It shouldn't matter what the tax base is or what your zip code is. Every child who has those needs deserves to, to have them met. And that's what we're trying to, that that is the wrong we're trying to right here. Yeah, because my kids go to a K through eight school, right? So they have um about 800 kids over there. And Portia is the therapist from Rise and she's been over there for eight years. Out of eight years, um. She's only had one other co-worker and he made, he lasted from September to January of this year, like last month. So, and those kids have to be put back on a wait list too. Now, I do know, cause I know the principal over there, we talk all the time. Out of those kids that lost their therapist, 14 have been suspended. And that's this school year alone. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that these are the stories that matter, you know, and this is what this is why we lobby. I, Brenda, I know I see you have your hand up. I think you're muted. Brenda, I think you're muted. Okay, can you hear uh, me? There you are. There you are. Okay, we got this. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Shoshana. Um, my comment is about um, the public schools. I know there's been a long fight with lowering class size. And I know to the effect that uh, charter schools always, you know, one of the things they try to attract parents is saying that they have a lower class size. So I think this is a good argument where um, since we passed, Governor Hochul signed that, that New York City um, lowered their class size, and now we're having a battle with the mayor and also with the chancellor. And so that money really should be targeted to our public schools. You know, we're setting up a two tier system, and it isn't right. There's no, when you do that, you know, it's very subtle. I noticed the charter schools are in areas where there are people of color, mm -hmm. you know? And so I don't know if people really pay attention to what's going on, but to me, it's sort of like, like you say, they take, they are very selective on the students they take. Whereas public school, we take all students. So I think, you know, the argument should be one, that's a priority. We need to get that class size uh, in effect, not just yeah. what's on paper. You know, it looks good on paper, but if it's not in force, then the ones that suffer are our children and the future. You're, you're so right. And I mean, I think it's always about the implementing of things, right? Like it's, it's super important. You have to pass the bill, but passing the bill is only the first step. It is all about the implementation. You know, and I think that that's the work, the work goes on after the session is over. I always feel like, you know, the passing of the bill is just the beginning, but no, that's a great point. All right. Thank you. No, thank you. Okay. Right. Sam, I'm going to kick it back to you because I know you, you want to have us do some practicing. 
Yes, absolutely. So if folks have continue to have questions or thoughts or just something that comes up that you want to discuss to, to, um, specific to the legislation, please continue to put that in the chat and we can kind of answer it in there. Um, but I do want to move us towards the, the discussion around messaging that Sami is going to take us through. And it really encapsulates that idea that Shoshana was really harnessing around um, putting the stories and the values behind the legislation is what's important and how we move legislators, right? So um, I'm gonna pass it to Sami to take us a bit further around discussing messaging, and then we'll move into the practice. Cool, thank you so much, Sam. Uh, and, and great to have everyone on uh, the call tonight. Um, I'm, I'm so, so happy that uh, we have like almost 40 people. Um, so, I'm just gonna cover a bit about um, the, the different fights that, that we're actually kind of fighting. Um, when we talk about policy, when we talk about messaging, right? Um, so we have the legislative fight and we have policy that we talk about, right? Um, and, and policy is expressed through numbers. We, we talk about facts and we talk about figures and that's really, really important, right? Um, but again, when we get personal with it, when we ask ourselves why we're in this fight, no one is ever gonna spout out the percentage, right? And that's exactly how we should think about uh, the fight when we talk to our legislators, when we talk to our representatives, and when we talk to our community members, right? Um, we always, when we are asked what we're in this for, we talk about personal things, right? That, that we believe every child deserves a quality education, right? or that we believe that every human being has inherent dignity, or that we believe it is the government's responsibility uh, to, to, to provide us these freedoms, right? We always lead from that. Um, or you can have a personal experience that's brought you face to face with that system, right? Whatever it is, we are always putting values front and center, right? And we do this by reiterating our top line messaging and having a story that we tell about the possibilities uh, that we uh, that, that 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 we imagine um, on which this issue should be built, right? Um, it can be one continuous narrative arc, or it can be a, a few pieces that can be built independently, right? Um, it frames a conflict with a clear moral anchor um rooted in values then it offers an affirmative vision right you're putting something out there in the world um it names a villain it names the doer of the action that is preventing us from reaching our goal and then it offers a clear affirmative vision it reiterates that vision that resonates with everyone that resonates with all audiences no matter what background or where they're coming from right um so it's really important again when we articulate that vision, we assign agency to the problem, right? Um, we don't have childcare, who's causing this, right? There's moneyed interests, right? Um, uh, we have policing interests that are causing us not, you know? So it's, it's really, really important for us to say, articulate what is actually happening in our state, what is actually happening around our political context that is causing this problem. And then we offer a big affirmative vision um, that helps us uh, articulate our values, right? Um, and if there's anything that you should take from this messaging practice, it should be that you always lead with values, right? You always start with a big framing statement that uh, articulates your values. Um, and, and it lets the, the whoever is listening um, uh, 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 understand why you're in this work, right? And once you start with that, the policy um, and the vision starts making a lot more sense, right? Um, so with that, we'll just do a little bit of, um, we'll just reiterate some of the top line messaging. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll read the first paragraph and I'll ask someone else to read the last two. So whatever our race, background or zip code, we all want high quality childcare and public education so our kids can thrive. For too long, some elected officials have failed to prioritize children and we are facing childcare and education crises. Who wants to read the next? I could be it's not right. Oh. oh, all right. It is not right that families can't find childcare or can't afford it when they do. 
It's not right that our children are stuck in schools and childcare situations that don't meet their developmental, emotional, or cultural needs. Um, anyone else? We need to guarantee every child and family has affordable, accessible child care options and public schools that are developmentally educated, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> educationally and culturally appropriate. When all of our children have excellent child care and education, we are better off, our communities are stronger, healthier, safer, and more prosperous. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda, and thank you, Tamara. Um, so what this does is we put our values front and center, right? Whatever, whatever background we are, we want high quality child care. We want public education because we all care about our kids, right? You're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna face a lot of people that are gonna be like, I don't care about the kids, right? So we put that front and center. We say, our, so our kids can thrive, we want this, right? And then we name a villain, right? That, that someone is doing this, that there are elected officials out there that have not prioritized children. And that's why we are in this crisis. That's why we're in this situation. It's not right that our children are stuck in schools and childcare situations that don't meet their needs, right? And then you articulate a big affirmative vision, right? We need to guarantee every child and family has affordable, accessible childcare options, right? And what happens when we do that? We have another vision, right? That all of our children, have, when all of our children have excellent childcare, we are all better off, right? And our communities are all better off, right? And that helps us articulate a vision that is both couched in, in facts, but also um, uh, leads with values, right? So it resonates with everyone who we speak to. Um, we can go next. Um, okay. Oh, you wanna? Oh, whatever works. <laughs> Sorry, Tommy. Um, I just wanted to, um, I saw uh, Lulu in the chat had asked if this presentation would be shared. It was not intended to share, but we can upon request. So you can email me, um, I'll put my email in chat and ask for it. We do have a one pager that we'll be sharing. That's a PDF before we leave though, just an FYI for folks. Um, so yes. Um, we're going to move into a practice now, 